Hello everyone, and welcome back to Gods and Myths of Northern Europe, Part 6. Today we will be reading The Doom of the Gods, starting with The Death of Baldur. <clears throat> Next, Ganglary learned of the event which led to the destruction of the Earth and of Asgard, the death of Baldur the Beautiful. Baldur, son of Odin, had ominous dreams, and the gods, fearing the danger threatened them, sent Frigg to extract an oath from all things on Earth whether living creatures, plants, or things of metal, wood, and stone, that they, could, that they would not harm Baldur. After this, they found it amusing to fling darts and hurl heavy objects at Baldur, knowing that they could do him no hurt. But Loki took on the disguise of a woman and talked with Frigg. He learned that one little plant, the mistletoe, had taken no oath, since Frigg had thought it too young to threaten Baldur. Filled with spite, Loki pulled up the mistletoe and pursue, persuaded Hodor, the blind god, to throw it at Baldur in sport, guying his hand as he threw. The dart pierced Baldur through, and he fell dead to the earth. Bitter indeed was the grief of the Aesir, and Odin's most bitter of all, since he alone knew the extent of the loss they had suffered. Frigg begged that someone would ride to the kingdom of death and bring Baldur back to them. Hermund, another of Odin's sons, agreed to make the perilous journey. Riding's, riding Odin's horse slept near. The gods, meanwhile, took up, took up Baldur's body and laid it on a funeral pyre built on, on his own ship, hurrying horny. A giantess pushed it off the rollers into the sea, and there Baldur was burned at the pyre, with his wife Nana, who had died of grief, and his horse beside him. Odin laid the gold ring, dropped near, one of the great treasures of the gods, upon the pyre as a last gift. All the gods and goddesses came to Baldur's funeral. Hermund's Ride to Hell Meanwhile, Hermund had been riding down the dark road to the land of the dead, and over the bridge that spanned the resounding river, there was a maid, Mudgud, guarding this bridge. She came out in wonder to see who came with such noise and tumult. Baldur, she said, had already passed that way, and five troops of the dead, but his but this newcomer was not like such travelers. It had the aspect of a living man. At last, Hermann reached Hellgate, and suddenly leaped over with ease. The Hall of Hell stood open before them, and Baldur was sitting in the high seat. Hell was willing to release him on one condition, that all things in the world, living or dead, would, would weep for him. But should any creature refuse to weep, she said, then he must stay with her and never go back to the Azir. So Hermann bade farewell to Baldur, who gave him Drapnir to bury back to Odin, and many rich gifts besides, and returned with Hel's answer. At the summons of the gods, all things did indeed weep for Baldur, men and beasts, stones and metals, in the way that we see all things weep after frost, when the air grows warm again. But at last the messenger of the gods came to a giantess alone in a cave. When they asked her to weep for Baldur, her reply was a deadly one. Alive or dead, the old man's son has been no use to me. Let hell hold what she has. It was believed that this giantess was no other than Loki himself, seeking in the, seeking in his malice to keep Baldur in hell. The Aesir were so wrathful that Loki knew this time he had no hope of mercy if they caught him. So he fled from them, built a house with doors looking out in every direction, and then changed himself into a salmon in the river. But Casavir, the wisest of the Azir, found some ashes on the hearth where Loki had been burning a net, and from the shape of this, he realized that this was the only way to catch the nimble salmon. They made, they made the net to Loki's pattern, at the third try they caught him by the tail. Loki was then bound across three flat stones held down by the entrails of one of his own sons. There he was, left to writhe beneath the mouth of a snake, which dropped its poison onto his face. His faithful wife, Sigyn, sat with a bowl to catch the poison drops. But each time she went to empty it, the poison fell on Loki again, and his struggles caused the earth to shake. Heavy stuff, y'all. <laughs> Ragnarok. There Loki must lie until Ragnarok, the time of the destruction of the gods. This fearful time would be ushered in by many... Importance. First, there would be great wars through the world, and a time of strife and hatred between men. The bonds of kinship will hold them no longer, and they will commit appalling deeds of murder and incest. 
There will also be a period of bitter cold where a terrible pursuing wolf catches the sun and devours her. But the moon too is to be swallowed up and the stars will fall from the sky. The mountains will crash into fragments as the whole earth shakes and trembles and the world tree, world tree quivers in the, in the tumult. Now all feathered monsters break loose. The wolf Fenrir advances, his great gaping jaws filling the gap between earth and sky, while the serpent emerges from the sea, blowing out poison. The sea rises to engulf the land, and on the flood, the ship Naglafar is launched, a vessel f made from the nails of dead men. It carries a crew of giants, with Loki at, as their steersman. From the fiery realm of Musfell, certain is following right out with shining swords and the bridge Bif Bifrost is shattered beneath their weight. His forces join the frost giants on the plain of Vigrid, and there the last battle will be fought between this mighty host and the gods. The note of Heimdall's horn arouses the Aesir to their danger, and Odin rides to the spring beneath the world tree to take counsel of Mimir's head. Then, with his chosen champions from Valhalla, he goes out onto the plain, to encounter at last his ancient enemy, the wolf. Thor meets the world serpent, and Frey, Frey fights against Surt. Tyr must encounter the hound Garm, broken loose from the underworld. While Heimdall does battle with Loki, all the gods must fall, and monsters be destroyed with them. Thor kills the serpent and then falls dead, overcome by its venom. Odin is devoured by Fenrir, but his young son Vidar slays the wolf in turn, setting one foot upon its, its jaw and tearing it asunder. Tyr and Heimdall both conquer their opponents, but they do not survive the struggle. Only Surt remains to the last, to fling, flyer, fling fire over the whole world, so that the race of men perishes with, with the gods, and all are finally engulfed in, in the overwhelming sea. The sun becomes dark, earth sinks in the sea, the shining stars slip out of the sky, vapor and fire rage fiercely together, till the leaping flame licks heaven itself. Yet, this is not the end. Earth will rise again from the waves, for a total green and, and fairer than ever before, cleansed of all suffering and evil. The sons of the great gods will remain alive, and Baldur will return from the dead to reign with them. They will rule a new universe, cleansed and regenerated, but two living creatures who have sheltered from destruction in the world tree will come out to repeople re the world with men and women. A new sun outshining her mother in beauty will return across the heavens. Such is the picture of the beginning and the end of the world, of gods and men, drawn by, for good glory by the three powers. I hope I wasn't talking too fast. That is all for today, and when we pick up again, we'll be reading about, reading about the giants and the dwarves, and the thought of the apples. So stay tuned.